cover normal early pregnancy and some common issues that occur in early pregnancy. Now I will run through this at a fairly rapid pace, but don't worry, these lectures are recorded and hopefully they'll be uploaded fairly soon and you can re-watch this at your leisure. I'm happy to take questions. Please feel free to drop them in the Q&A box and hopefully at the end of the lecture we'll have time to go through them. So we're just going to dive in the first question. And I'm just going to the question and put in your answer on the poll. Great, so thank you for all who participated in the poll. So most of you got the correct answer, which was A, G6, P3 plus 2. So let's talk about gravidity and eating. Let's take gravidity first. This is generally written using the abbreviation G and states the number of gravid events, i.e. the number of times a person has been pregnant. This includes any current pregnancy, and each pregnancy counts as one, regardless of if it was a twin or triplet pregnancy. Each pregnancy also counts as one, regardless of outcome. So miscarriages, terminations and stillbirths are all counted in this number. There's a few other term terminology terms as like including gravidity. So one who is pregnant is described as gravid. A gravida person is a G0, a person who has never been pregnant. A primigravida is a person who's currently pregnant for the first time and a multigravida is a person who's been pregnant more than once. However, we usually use this term for people that have been pregnant more than a couple of times. So let's talk about parity. So parity is the number of Paris events, i.e. the number of times a person has given birth. And this has the caveat of to a pregnancy with a gestational age of at least 24 weeks, regardless of if the fetus was born alive, stillborn. This number includes both vaginal deliveries and caesarean sections. They're both counted as Paris events. And giving birth to multiple pregnancy, such as twins or triplets, is still counted as one Paris event. Miscarriages and terminations. So parity is suffixed by the number of miscarriages or terminations a woman's had. So this includes miscarriages of less than 24 weeks gestation, regardless of how early. Uh, some women will experience an early miscarriage at home and they might not actually seek medical attention. So it's important to take a full history from your, your patient to include these events. It's worth noting that a pregnancy loss greater than 24 weeks gestation is not termed a miscarriage. Instead, this is termed a stillbirth and is counted in the parity number we talked about in the last slide. This also includes terminations of any gestation. Now, late terminations greater than 24 weeks are incredibly rare, but they are included in this number. So looking back at the question, this woman is currently pregnant and has had five other pregnancies. So she is gravida six or G6. Looking at parity, how many times has this patient given birth to a pregnancy of at least 24 weeks gestation? And looking at her history, she gave birth in 2015, 2017 and 2019. 
So this number P is three. Considering miscarriages and terminations, she's had a miscarriage in 2014 and a termination in 2019. So this suffix is two. So there we go, she's G6, P3 plus two. Let's move on to question two, and I'd like to read the answer to the question with the poll. Thank you again for participating. And again, almost um, the vast majority of you got the correct answer here. So the correct answer was E, 8th of November. So let's talk about calculating the estimated date of delivery. And this is calculated using Nagalee's rule. And this is an easy way to calculate the estimated date of delivery based on the first day of the women's last menstrual period or the LMP. The calculation we do is we add one year and seven days to the first year of the LMP and we subtract three months. It's worth noting that this method is not accurate in women with irregular or long cycles or women who have recently been exposed to oral contraceptives. And it's important to note for women that this is an estimate. This is not the hard and fast rule of when you're going to have your baby. In practice, most doctors and midwives have a pregnancy wheel where you simply plug in the LMP and read off the date at 40 weeks. So if you look at the question again, apply Nagley's rule, her LMP was the 1st of February. If we add one year, that takes us to the 1st of February next year. We add seven days, that takes us to the 8th of February, and we subtract three months, so that takes us to the 8th of November. So let's move on to question three, and again I'll give you a minute to read and answer the question. Great, thank you for participating there. And most of you are correct. The single best answer there is B, oral folic acid at 400 micrograms per day. So let's talk about supplements and vitamins in pregnancy. Now the NICE guidelines and the Royal College of Obstetricians recommend two supplements. The first one is folic acid at a dose of 400 micrograms per day. This has good evidence to show that it reduces the occurrence of neural tube defects and is recommended for all women trying to conceive and for up to 12 weeks gestation. The other supplement that's recommended is vitamin D at a dose of 10 micrograms or 400 units per day. And this has been shown to be beneficial in, the, in fetal bone formation and is recommended for all pregnant women throughout pregnancy and into breastfeeding. 
There's no evidence for routine supplementation of zinc, vitamin C or vitamin E. And there's also no evidence for higher doses of vitamin D and higher doses of folic acid in well-nourished, healthy women without additional risk factors. A wee note about vitamin A. So vitamin A supplementation in pregnancy can be actively dangerous. Excessive vitamin A is teratogenic and should be limited in pregnancy. In fact, pregnant women are advised at booking to avoid foods high in vitamin A, such as liver and liver products. A wee note about iron. This is usually comes as ferrous sulfate or ferrous fumarate. Iron supplementation is not routinely required in pregnancy. Women have a full blood count obtained at their booking appointment and only if their haemoglobin is low would they be recommended to take oral iron. And what about vitamin D? That's usually supplied as ergocalciferol or colocalciferol. Now vitamin D is normally obtained from sunlight and is required in small amounts to support fetal bone formation. A low dose of 10 micrograms or 400 units is recommended to all pregnant women throughout pregnancy and breastfeeding. In fact, there's an argument that vitamin D supplementation is beneficial for all adults during the winter months when we get less sun. Now, a higher dose of vitamin D at 800 to 1000 units is recommended for selected patient groups, such as women who have reduced exposure to sunlight, obese women, or those that are found to be vitamin D deficient. And a note about folic acid. So as we already said, folic acid is recommended for all pregnant women at a dose of 400 micrograms per day. And this is recommended to all women pre-pregnancy and up to 12 weeks gestation. Now a higher dose of five milligrams is recommended for women at high risk of neural tube defects. So these include women with a previous fetus with a neural tube defect, women with epilepsy, diabetes and obesity. So if we go back to our question here, the correct answer is oral folic acid at 400 micrograms per day. Vitamin A is definitely not correct as this is actively teratogenic and should be avoided. Oral ferrous sulfate, that's iron, and as discussed, that's not routinely recommended. Vitamin D is recommended, but at a dose of 10 micrograms or 400 units per day. This dose of 1000 micrograms would be huge. And again, we spoke about oral folic acid, and that is recommended, but at a dose of 400 micrograms per day, with this higher dose only suitable for women at higher risk. So let's move on to question four. And again, I'll give you a minute to answer that. Great, thanks for answering. And most of you got the correct answer there, which was E, progesterone. So let's talk about pregnancy and hormones. Progesterone is pretty much the pregnancy hormone and it's increased throughout pregnancy. It's produced by the corpus luteum in early pregnancy, the first four weeks, and it's produced by the placenta thereafter. In early pregnancy, it functions to maintain the pregnancy by stimulating endometrial thickening. In later pregnancy, it functions to stimulate the smooth muscle of the uterus to relax to accommodate the growing pregnancy. This has the unfortunate side effect of also affecting smooth muscle of the GI tract, leading to reduced tone of the esophageal sphincters and gastroesophageal reflux. It also affects bladder tone and, in, and results in an increased risk of urinary tract infection. Thinking about other hormones in pregnancy, we have estradiol, and that's the other hormone of pregnancy. It promotes uterine blood flow and myometrial growth, and it contributes to cervical softening. It also contributes to nipple growth and is responsible for the increased pigmentation and water retention seen in pregnancy. Oxytocin is increased principally during labour and breastfeeding. It promotes dilation of the cervix and also promotes contractions. 
Oxytocin is also important during bonding, during skin-to-skin -skin contact and breastfeeding, promoting feelings of love. Prolactin is markedly increased throughout pregnancy and promotes the production of breast milk in later pregnancy. Gastrin is found to be higher in pregnancy and functions to stimulate the secretion of gastric acid in the stomach and promotes gastric emptying. So if we go back to the question there, the hormone responsible for the smooth muscle relaxation of the esophagus is progesterone. So we'll move on to the next question. And again, I'll give you a moment to answer that. Thank you for answering there. Um, some mixed answers for this one, so we'll go through this one quite carefully. So most of you actually answered A, cyclozine 50 milligrams oral. Now the single best answer here is actually C, 12.5 milligrams of intramuscular procorpyrazine. So we'll go through this one quite carefully because I think you've got some mixed answers there, so we'll make sure we've covered this. So let's talk about nausea and vomiting in pregnancy. Now, nausea and vomiting in pregnancy is super common, affecting more than half of all pregnancies. It's most common in the first trimester and it usually settles by the second trimester. True hyperemesis gravidarum is persistent and intractable vomiting. And this leads to the point where if even fluids cannot be kept down. This leads to weight loss, dehydration and electrolyte imbalances and is actually pretty rare. So when someone presents with nausea and vomiting in pregnancy, First, you need to obviously take a detailed history, being careful to determine what the patient's oral intake has been the last few days. You'd also want to perform a clinical examination and routine observations, looking for evidence of dehydration, such as hypotension and dry mucous membranes. One of the first investigations you'll do is a urinalysis, a simple urine dip. And here you're looking for the presence of ketones. Now, ketones are produced by the liver from fat metabolism when the body is in short supply of glucose. Therefore, presence of ketones indicates that oral intake is insufficient. It's also important to check bloods, particularly the urine ease, to check for signs of dehydration and electrolyte imbalance. First line management is with an antiemetic. Now, if the patient is able to tolerate sips of water, you can give oral, and the first line here is cyclozine. If the patient is vomiting or unlikely to tolerate oral intake, IM prochlorpyrazine is used. Now, the reason we don't go straight for IM or IV cyclozine is that quite a lot of times the department don't have IM cyclozine and quite often this patient won't have IV access straight away. So you can give IV procorpyrazine straight away without worrying about getting access. If the woman has evidence of dehydration, so if she has ketones, hypotension, anything like that, then it sounds like she needs IV fluids plus or minus electrolyte replacement. So normally we just replace fluids with something like Hartman's, but do be mindful if her potassium is low, she will need replacement. And then light diet is introduced as tolerated. Now normally these patients do quite well and some IV fluids and some antiemetics work great and the women are discharged with a supply of antiemetics to take home with them. So let's talk about some other antiemetic drugs and I'm aware that these do vary slightly depending on where you work. So I'm just going to go on what the guidelines are that I follow up here in Scotland. 
So as I said, the first line for women that can take oral cyclosine um, is 50 milligrams of oral cyclosine. And like I said, it can also be given IV or IM, but we prefer IM procopyrazine as it works so fast and it's readily available. Other antiemetics we can use are promethazine, metaclopramide and ondansetron. These are sort of second and third line medications and some of them are not licensed in pregnancy, but they have good safety data and are commonly used. A course of corticosteroids, either oral or IV, is the final pharmacological management for hyperemesis. These are for women who have tried all different antiemetics and are still vomiting. And if nothing is working, depending on gestation, the woman may opt for termination of pregnancy. And if she's needing term, delivery. I've not seen many women terminate pregnancy just for nausea and vomiting, but it does happen. So let's go back to the question. Now, I said the single best answer there is I am procopyrazine. And just to go through a few details on this slide here, so this woman's in early pregnancy, the typical time for troublesome nausea and vomiting. Her urinalysis shows lots of ketones, so that shows that she's malnourished and dehydrated. She's also tachycardic and she's actively vomiting. I wouldn't be too worried about the small streaks of blood. That can happen if a woman is actively vomiting lots. Um, you'd just be worried if she was vomiting up large volumes of blood. So in this case, we give IM, procopyrazine, and probably some IV fluids. We wouldn't use oral cyclozine as the woman is actively vomiting and she's unlikely to keep it down. And like we discussed, metaclopamide, undanzotron, and hydrocortisone, they're all sort of second, third, and last line antiemetic drugs. So I hope that makes sense. So let's move on to question six about early pregnancy loss. And again, I'll give you a moment to answer that one. Great, thanks for participating there. And most of you got the correct answer, which was C, an incomplete miscarriage. So let's talk about early pregnancy loss. Now, early pregnancy loss or miscarriage is super common. And it's estimated to occur in up to 15 to 20% of all pregnancies and possibly up to 40% of all conceptions. Miscarriage is defined as a loss of pregnancy before 24 weeks. Now, the vast majority of these are in the first trimester before 12 weeks. Like we said before, some early miscarriages might not even be accounted for. So, for example, if the woman's period is one or two weeks late, this might represent a miscarriage rather than just a late period. There's a lot of terminology surrounding miscarriage, so we'll go through each one and we'll define it. So starting with an inevitable miscarriage. This is a pregnancy loss that is inevitable. Nothing can be done to stop it. This might present with abdominal pain and, and or vaginal bleeding with no passage of tissue. If a scan is performed, it might reveal an intrauterine pregnancy, so a pregnancy in the womb. It might be non-viable. So there might be a gestational sac, but no fetal pole, or there might be a fetus, but no fetal heartbeat. Depends on gestation. If you perform a speculum examination, the os is open. Now, patients might be managed expectedly with a watch and wait approach. In this case, the women can normally go home and await events. It's important to carefully counsel these women on what to expect and when to seek assistance. Most women will pass the pregnancy tissue within 7 to 14 days, and women should be advised to take a home pregnancy test after three weeks of passing the tissue and to seek advice if that remains positive. Other methods of management are medical management, and this is usually with the use of misoprostol. So this is a prostaglandin analogue, which causes smooth muscle contraction of the myometrium, resulting in expulsion of the uterine contents. 
and surgical management, and that's usually with a dilatation and curettage under general anaesthetic. In a threatened miscarriage, there is a possibility of miscarriage, but this is not certain. This again might present with abdominal pain plus or minus vaginal bleeding and with no passage of tissue. If an ultrasound scan is performed, it shows an intrauterine pregnancy that's viable. And on speculum examination, the cervical os remains closed. If observations are normal and the patient is otherwise well, they can be discharged with analgesia, but it's really important to carefully counsel these women that this might progress to a miscarriage. A complete miscarriage occurs when following a pregnancy loss, all of the products of conception have been expelled from the uterus and bleeding is settling or has already stopped. An ultrasound scan if performed would show an empty uterus. And in speculum examination, the os might remain open or it might have closed up again. If well, these patients can usually be discharged following counselling. An incomplete miscarriage is a miscarriage where not all of the pregnancy tissues have been passed. Again, it can present with abdominal pain, plus or minus vaginal bleeding. This might be settling or have settled completely and is associated with passage of some pregnancy tissues. On an ultrasound exam, if performed, products of conception can often be seen persisting in the uterus. On a speculum examination, the os may be open or it might have closed again, or you might actually be able to see products of conception stuck in the os. Patients with incomplete miscarriage can be managed again with watchful waiting. They can also be managed medically with misoprostol or surgically with dilatation and curettage. The thing to note here is if on speculum examination you can see products of conception in the os, it's important to take these out as these will cause ongoing bleeding. A septic miscarriage is any pregnancy loss associated with infection uh, where some or all of the pregnancy tissues have been passed. The patient usually presents unwell with a fever, abdominal pain and vaginal bleeding or discharge. If an ultrasound scan is performed, it might show products of conception still in the uterus. It might show hemorrhagic focus or a focus of infection. On speculum examination, the os might be open or closed and quite often you see a full discharge coming from the os. Patients with a septic miscarriage do require admission to hospital and should be managed with the sepsis 6 protocol, including intravenous antibiotics. These patients are not suitable for expectant management or medical management and instead quite often require theatre for removal of the infected products of conception left behind. So looking back at the question, the single best answer here is incomplete miscarriage. It's not a complete miscarriage, but she continues to, so it sounds like it's not quite complete. It's not a septic miscarriage, she's got no evidence of sepsis, she seems well. And it's not threatened or inevitable, as the miscarriage seems like it's ongoing, she's describing passage of tissue. So let's move on to question seven, and you'll get a moment to answer that. Great, thank you for answering. So most of you got the correct answer, which was B, expectant management tracking of beta HCG levels. So let's talk about pregnancy of unknown location. 
So pregnancy of unknown location is a term used to define a woman who has a positive pregnancy test, but the location of the pregnancy has not yet been determined. And of note, this includes all pregnant women who haven't had a scan. These patients can present asymptomatically or might have pain or vaginal bleeding. On ultrasound scan, the pregnancy cannot be found in the uterus or elsewhere. On speculum examination, the cervical os is closed. Now these patients can have several possible outcomes. It may simply be an early intrauterine pregnancy that's too small to be seen on ultrasound. Or it might be an ectopic pregnancy, or it might have been a complete miscarriage where all the tissues have been passed. When a patient presents with a pregnancy of unknown location, you should take bloods including a haemoglobin, group and save and a beta HCG level. And you should arrange for an a transvaginal or a transabdominal ultrasound scan because we want to find out where is this pregnancy. If these patients are unwell, you must admit them. Ongoing management, if the patient is well, we can proceed with HCG tracking. And if they're unwell, if they're septic, hypotensive, we normally just proceed straight to theatre for a diagnostic laparotomy. Laparoscopy, sorry. So let's talk about beta HCG, beta human chorionic gonadotrophin. It's a bit of a mouthful. This is a substance secreted by the trophoblast cells in early pregnancy and functions to maintain early pregnancy. As you can see by the graph there, it rises exponentially in early pregnancy and at least doubles every 40 hours until reaching a peak at week 10. Ectopic pregnancies and pregnancies that are failing or resulting in a miscarriage are associated with a suboptimal rise in HCG. And you can see that on the graph there with the blue line, that's a suboptimal rise. A miscarriage would result in a decrease of HCG. So when looking at HCG results, we look at the, for, look at the change over 40 hours. So we bring the lady back exactly 40 hours later and take a repeat sample. If this rises by greater than 66% over 40 hours, this is normal and it probably indicates an early intrauterine pregnancy. In this case, the next step would be to organise another scan to see if that, if that scan was too, if the pregnancy was too small to see on the first scan. If it rises, but not quite as much as 66%, we call this a suboptimal rise. And this indicates that it might be an ectopic pregnancy or failing pregnancy of unknown location. And we manage this as ectopic pregnancy. If the HCG is falling, like I said, this usually indicates a failing pregnancy that's possibly going to result in miscarriage. We normally go by a three strikes and you're out approach. If you don't have a diagnosis and a management plan after two or three HCGs, you need to seek senior advice. So let's talk about ectopic pregnancies. And these are pregnancies not in the uterus. Women can be asymptomatic or can present with pain. Pain is typically unilateral and may radiate to the shoulder tip. They might also have vaginal bleeding, dizziness, or even collapse. Clinical signs on examination may include a tender cervix, tender adenexy, or you might even be able to feel a mass when you do a bimanual exam. Always remember to assess for signs of peritonism as well. Ultrasound scan can show an obvious ectopic pregnancy and might also show free fluid. Like I said, beta HCG would likely be a suboptimal rise. Ectopic pregnancies are almost always in the fallopian tubes. However, they can be anywhere, for example, the abdominal wall, ovary, cervix. And it's important to note that these pregnancies are not viable. So it's important to tell the women that these pregnancies are not viable. If we go through management of ectopic pregnancy, expectant management is for women who are clinically stable with a low initial beta HCG with minimal or no symptoms. This normally requires the beta HCG to be re repeated every 40 hours to confirm that the pregnancy is falling until it's reached a very low level indicating the pregnancy has gone. Medical management with this methotrexate. Now methotrexate is an anti-folate drug which targets rapidly dividing cells, essentially killing them off. This option also requires beta HCG checking at day four and day seven, and the women might require repeat doses of methotrexate depending on those levels. Methotrexate obviously is highly teratogenic, so the women must be counseled not to become pregnant again within three months of having methotrexate treatment. And surgical management is via laparoscopy, so telescope into the, into the abdomen to manually remove the ectopic pregnancy and the structure to which it's attached. So quite often that involves removal of a fallopian tube or an ovary. 
So looking back at the question, this lady has a pregnancy of unknown location. Topic pregnancy, or it might be a small intrauterine pregnancy that's too small to see on a scan. Since she's well and she's got minimal pain, she sounds like she's suitable for outpatient beta HCG tracking. Why are the other questions, why are the other answers incorrect? Now, this patient might have an ectopic pregnancy, so she can't simply be reassured and discharged. She does need follow up. Misoprostol is used in the medical management of miscarriages and terminations. This woman doesn't appear to be having a miscarriage and she wouldn't be suitable for management with misoprostol. Methotrexate is a folic acid antagonist, like we said. It's usually used in patients with a proven ectopic pregnancy and there's quite strict criteria for its use. This pregnancy has not been proven as ectopic, so methotrexate would not be appropriate. And we normally wouldn't proceed directly to diagnostic laparoscopy in a pregnancy of, in a woman that's so well. Had this woman been in severe pain with abnormal observations, we might have proceeded directly to emergency surgery. So we'll move on to the next question. Again, you'll get a moment to answer that. Great, thank you for participating. Most of you got the correct answer there, which was C, endometriosis. So let's have a wee chat about risk factors for ectopic pregnancy. These are things that you've got to be careful to ask about when ectopic pregnancy is on the differential. So the top risk factor for ectopic pregnancy is having had a previous ectopic pregnancy. Other common risk factors are having had pelvic inflammatory disease, either currently or in the past. So it's important to ask about a history of STIs such as chlamydia or gonorrhea. Having an intrauterine contraceptive device or system in situ. This is a funny one because IUDs are over 99.9% .9 effective at preventing pregnancy. But for that lucky 0.01% that managed to get pregnant with one, the pregnancy is more likely to be ectopic. Other risk factors are assisted conception, for example IVF, any sort of pelvic surgery, smoking, older age and endometriosis. Now, the reason endometriosis is a risk factor is because it can form scar tissue and adhesions and distort the normal anatomy. In addition, having this inflammatory state in the pelvis can alter normal tube physiology. So looking back at the question, there's no evidence that having an irregular side risk factor evidence that medical terminations are factor for ectopic. However, if she's had many surgical terminations, this would be associated with a small increase. And there's no evidence that history of intrauterine device use as a teenager would be any increased risk of ectopic. So we're nearly there. We're going to move on to the next question, which is about termination of pregnancy. And I'll give you a minute to answer that one.
great, thank you for answering. And most of you got that one correct. The correct answer was B, 200 milligrams of mifepristone followed by 800 micrograms of misoprostol. That was a hard question, sorry. Let's talk about termination of pregnancy. So terminations in the UK are governed by the Abortion Act of 1967. And there's five categories for requesting termination of pregnancy. Category A is for any gestation where being pregnant would involve risk to the woman's life. Category B is for any gestation where there's risk to the woman's mental or physical health. Category C is for pregnancies under 24 weeks gestation where there is a risk to the woman's physical or mental health. Category D is a pregnancy under 24 weeks with a risk to the woman's existing children. And E is any gestation where there's substantial risk of the unborn child being born seriously handicapped. So again, there's a few different management plans for termination of pregnancy. Medical termination of pregnancy is suitable for all gestations. It usually proceeds with two parts. The first part is mifepristone. This is a progesterone receptor antagonist and it functions to inhibit, inhibit circulating progesterone functioning to cause endometrial degeneration, cervical softening and increases uterine sensitivity to prostaglandins. The second part is usually repeated, is usually completed 24 to 48 hours later and comprises the administration of misoprostol and this can be given within the vagina or it can be given orally. Misoprostol is a prostaglandin analogue, I think we already said that, and it causes smooth muscle contractions to cause expulsion of the uterine contents. In terms of doses, these might vary from trust to trust, but generally, mifepristone is given at first as a standard dose of 200 milligrams. Then misoprostol is given 24 to 48 hours later. The dose of misoprostol varies with gestation. A lower dose is given at later gestations as the uterus naturally becomes more sensitive to prostaglandins. Repeated doses of misoprostol might be required to cause complete termination. In cases of advanced gestation over 20 weeks, feticide might be performed first. And this is usually via the injection of intercardiac potassium chloride. And this functions to stop the fetal heart and prevent the fetus from being born with signs of life. Surgical termination of pregnancy is the other option and is also suitable for all gestations. Cervical preparation is sometimes performed with mifepristone or misoprostol and that just makes the procedure easier, it makes it easier to enter the cervix. The procedure is either suction termination of pregnancy, which is performed in early pregnancies, or via dilatation and evacuation or curettage, commonly known as a D&C. So if we go back to the question here, the single best answer is B, 200 milligrams of mifepristone followed by 800 micrograms of misoprostol. If we go through the other answers there. So A, olipristal acetate, that's a progesterone receptor modulator. Now that functions to delay ovulation and is used for the prevention of pregnancy, commonly known as the morning after pill. In terms of doses, 800 micrograms is a fairly standard dose for early gestations and the 100 microgram dose would be more suitable for later gestations. Looking at methotrexate, methotrexate is obviously used for management of ectopic pregnancy and that's not what's happening here. And E, intravenous infusion of oxytocin. We wouldn't normally use oxytocin for terminations of pregnancy. However, you might have heard of it as it's a common adjunct to normal labour. So we're nearly there, we're on to the last question and I'll give you a minute to answer that one.
great. Thank you for answering there. We've got some mixed responses here. The single best answer here was D, a routine bloods to be taken. So we'll just go through this one and talk a bit more about terminations of pregnancy. So it's important to counsel women on what will happen when they undergo a termination of pregnancy. She will experience bleeding. This will be heavier than a period. She will experience abdominal pain, contractions or cramps and she will expel pregnancy tissue from her vagina. It's important to counsel her on what she's going to see and what size it's going to be, depending on gestation. It's important to tell the women a couple of things. Firstly, that bleeding can continue for four to six weeks and it can actually run into the next period. A positive urinary pregnancy test can persist for up to three to four weeks. One of the most common complications of termination of pregnancy is infection and retained products of conception. Other complications are significant bleeding or injury to the uterus if a surgical method is used. So what is retained products of conception? This means not all of the pregnancy tissues have been expelled and this can cause ongoing bleeding, infection and pain. Sometimes it's quite difficult to delineate as vaginal bleeding can continue for up to six weeks post termination and bleed into the next menstrual period. If you suspect retained products of conception and the woman is well, She's usually treated with oral antibiotics, for example, coamoxiclav. If she's unwell and that there's signs of systemic infection, you need to consider treating with IV antibiotics. If there's excessive pain, heavy bleeding, full discharge, consider an ultrasound scan. And that's to look for if there is products left in the uterus. And this might require surgical evacuation of any materials left inside. So let's look back at the question. So this woman has light bleeding, four weeks after termination and she's otherwise well. So it's tempting to jump in with urgent investigations, ultrasound scans, DNC. However, the single best answer here is to arrange for routine bloods. She doesn't need any urgent management as she's so well and she's having minimal bleeding, which might be normal following a termination. A urinary pregnancy test would not be helpful in this case as it could still be positive and doesn't really tell you anything. She's got no markers of sepsis, so she doesn't need IV antibiotics. Bloods will help you guide further management. Does she have high inflammatory markers? Does she need IV antibiotics? Is, has she become anemic? So it's important not to jump in with urgent investigations when there's simple things you can do first. So that's what I've got to the end of the lecture. Um, I'm just gonna go through your questions and answer if I can shed any light there. Um, let's have a wee look. So one of the attendees was asking about the skin-like substance. Um, so that's the most common description that I've had of a woman passing pregnancy tissue. They, they describe it as skin or jelly-like substance. So I've used that terminology just because it is so common in terms of patients describing that. A patient's not going to tell you they've passed a gestational sac. They're going to tell you they've passed a blob of skin stuff. So that's why I used that terminology. So yeah, that was what I was meaning there. Um, Sam's asking, does superfetation still count as one gravid event? Now, I think that means when you become pregnant with two different gestations. I've actually had to Google this term. I have never seen that happen. And I have no idea if that would count as one gravid event or not. I presume that would still be one gravid event. But in all honesty, I don't know. I have never seen it. And that is not going to come up in your finals. <laughs> um, James is asking, are these finals um, questions? Yes, these are. These are questions that you'd be, you could be asked in your finals. Um, someone is asking, in ectopic pregnancy, is referred pain to the shoulder tip on the same side as the ectopic pregnancy? So, for example, if it was in the right shoulder tip, would it be in the right fallopian tube? No, not necessarily. So the reason you get shoulder tip pain is because the diaphragm is becoming irritated and it doesn't matter which side it's on, you can get either side of shoulder tip pain. For, clinically, I, I feel like I've found it more commonly in the left shoulder, but I, there is no association, I don't think. So shoulder tip pain, suspect ectopic, doesn't matter what shoulder. Someone is asking about um, mifepristone and the need if she's in early gestation, less than 12 weeks. This might differ with locality, but certainly in my practice, we've always given mifepristone to prime the cervix. We've always done part one and then part two. Someone is asking what gestation is surgical suction done up to? depends on what surgeons you have available. So in some hospitals, they will do a suction termination up to 12 weeks. 
and some of them they need to be in earlier gestation that will be that will definitely depend on the, the people that work there the obstetricians that work there and what equipment and staff they have so i can't really say a definitive answer for that Um, question 10, we we're asking, would beta HCG be helpful because it would tell you if she has gestational trophoblast disease? A urinary HCG is either positive or negative. So if that was positive, that tells you nothing. And if that's negative, that also tells you nothing. Um, in cases of gestational trophoblast disease, we need a serum HCG. And usually the serum HCG is very high. So that would be maybe a helpful measure. But urinary HCG, not helpful in that case. Um, and the last question, when are oral antibiotics indicated for termination of pregnancy? So in that last question, I'll just go back to it so that you can see it one second. So she, this lady just had a termination a few weeks ago. Um, again, this is going to be from, from trust to trust. Um, certainly if, if she's had any sort of temperature, any purulent discharge, I would certainly treat with oral antibiotics. Even if she's had any sort of suprapubic pain four weeks down the line, I would probably still give oral antibiotics. Certainly she was totally well, no pain, minimal bleeding. You'd maybe get away with not giving oral antibiotics, but generally most places will give them as a precaution to, to obviously treat retained products. And someone's asking about complications for termination. Let me just whiz back to that one. So here we go, termination of pregnancy complications. The most common ones are infection and retained products. Significant bleeding and injury to the uterus, you don't normally see those. And if a woman is having significant bleeding, it's normally because she's got an infection. And someone's asking, is DNC and ERCP the same? I'm not sure what ERCP stands for in this um, context. DNC stands for dilatation and curatage. So dilatation is simply passing a scope into the through the stretching that cervix up so that you can pass it into either suck out pregnancy or to break up the pregnancy using other instruments. I'm not sure what ERCP actually stands for in that in that case. Yeah, that's that's what I was thinking. I was thinking ERCP as in um, cholangiopancreatum. Yeah. ERCP, evacuate retained products of conception. Evacuation of retained products of conception covers both suction termination and poking out the products with any other sort of instrument. So that's a kind of catch-all phrase. I've never heard that be abbreviated to ERCP before though. <laughs> that's confusing. So I hope that answers all of your questions. I'll pop my email address up there at the end. Feel free to contact either me directly, QuizMed or Study Hub if you've got any other questions. And I hope you've enjoyed it, learned something, and I hope you'll join us for the next session.